Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. A reminder, as you are making your travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is our Priceline affiliate link, so part of the purchase price supports the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. Now let's get into the conclusion of this week's Yours Truly Johnny Dollar Serial. The original air dates on this are August 8th, 9th, and 10th of 1956. It's the Older Matter, Episodes 3, 4, and 5. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Constance Alder, Mr. Dollar. Are you all right? Sure, Mrs. Alder. What made you think I might not be? Well, just your having left the living room. Being in your own room like this, Well, I... nothing wrong, Mrs. Alder. I'm fine. I- I'm sorry, El Montante took so long with his cape handling demonstration. I hope you weren't bored. Not in the least. He's very good. But you did leave. That isn't necessarily a sign of boredom, is it, Mrs. Alder? You left before I did. <laughs> yes, of course. The hostess has to keep busy, you know. Sure. And like I said, I wasn't bored. I only left because I wanted a little air. I went out on the patio for it. Wonderful spot, Mrs. Alder. You can see everything. The harbor, the slope down from the house, even anyone who might be on it. I want to see you, Mr. Dollar. Talk to you. That figures. Where? Your car. Half an hour. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Caracas, Venezuela... To the Home Office Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Alder Matter. Expense account continued. Sometimes it takes only a few well-chosen words to start the mountain coming to Muhammad. And it looked like I'd picked the right ones with Constance Alder. Whatever she had to say, I wanted to hear it. Because it was a cinch nobody else in this rat race was giving away any information. Yeah, I wanted very much to hear what Mrs. Alder had to say. I headed downstairs right away because I have a fetish about being early. But my timing was bad. Hey, Dollar, you got a minute? Well, I can hardly say no to my host, Mr. Alder. Come on in the den. Anything the matter? There's cuts on your face. What happened? Your daughter's boyfriend... Paul Kincaid? Yeah, he's got the idea you hired me to bust up that little romance. He didn't like it. That idiot. Is that all you've got to say, Mr. Alder? What? Because if it is, let me tell you how I feel about it, where I stand. Look, Dollar... No, you look. I know you're the insured, but I just about had it with you. I don't have to take that kind of talk. I think you do. You ask me to keep you alive, but you won't lift a finger to help. Every time I ask you a question, you look the other way, do an imitation of a clam... What am I supposed to be, a mind reader? All I want you to do is protect me. Oh, come on, come on, Alder. You're smarter than that. Protect you from what? You've almost been tagged out once. You must have an idea who made that try and why. I have no idea. Just like that, huh? Mr. Dollar... Look, Mr. Alder... Don't you see that by not opening up, you're making a clay pigeon out of yourself? I... uh, I can tell you nothing. 
You know that I'd be justified in suggesting my company cancel the policy. Well, you'll have to suit yourself about that. Excuse me. Just a minute. What did you tell your family and guests about me? Who am I supposed to be? An old friend from up in the States. Uh Uh-huh. You realize something, old friend? That's the first question I ever asked that you had an answer for. It's the first one I considered you had a right to ask. Mr. Alder. Yes? Whose side are you on? Yours? Or the person who's trying to kill you? Oil-rich Billy Alder, business mind par excellence, super salesman deluxe. The man who could sell or talk you into anything. But could he say one word that might keep another bullet from coming his way? It sure didn't look like it. I left the den, was just starting out to my car to meet Mrs. Alder. I must have been real anxious for our chat because I suddenly realized I'd forgotten my car keys. I hurried back upstairs and at the top almost bowled over a woman who was about to come down. Oh, Oh, I'm so sorry. My fault. That's all right. No, no. I should have looked where I was going. Here, uh, are you hurt, Miss... It's perfectly all right. Excuse me, please. Sure was a hard house to make acquaintances in, even when they were old and drab and stern looking. Well, I went to my room, got my car keys and my wallet, which lay alongside them. The position of the wallet was interesting. I shut the door, headed once more for my car. The lady of the house was waiting, we took off. I know who you are, Mr. Dollar, while you're here. I'm sure you do. I was just back in my room. What? I'll give you a tip. Never search a pro's room. He always puts an article down in a certain position, then memorizes it automatically. A search you can never replace it exactly the same way. With me, it's wallets. I did not go into your room. Oh? Then name a guess for me, will you? Fifty-ish kind of lady, kind of faded, severe looking? Why? I'm just curious. Doris Cole, a very old friend from the States. Mind telling me where her room is? Right next to yours. Why? Well, I just ran into her as she was coming downstairs. She looked a little, um, call it worried. That's ridiculous. She'd have no more reason to search your room than I would. Sure. Let's forget it. A little while ago, I saw you searching out on the slope. And you know I saw you. Now, what were you looking for? An empty cartridge? You think I fired that shot at my husband? Someone did. And there are easier places to go for a stroll than on that slope. I know what you're thinking. But you're wrong. I just wanted to see if I could find some trace of whoever had done it. A shell from a gun. Well, that's interesting, to say the least. I don't like your tone, Mr. Dollar. I don't blame you, because you just made a boo-boo. Only an automatic ejects a shell. A revolver doesn't. In other words, you knew what kind of gun was used. Uncomfortable, Mrs. Alder? (sighs) Why don't you go home? Like to live dangerously, Mrs. Alder? Slapping the driver of a moving car? Pretty foolish, isn't it? Sorry, I'm very sorry. All right, tell me something. How did you know what I was really here for? My husband. I made him tell me. Well, congratulations. I can't get him to tell me the time of day. And he knows whose side I'm on. We rode back to the house without exchanging another word, and one thing was obvious. The chic Mrs. Alder had apologized all right, but the anger I'd stirred up could have powered a fair-sized city for a week. When we reached the house, she simply got out, headed for it as though I were a process server she wanted to get away from. I went to my room, trying not to look like a process server, to figure what my next step would be. I was suddenly very grateful to whoever had chosen my room because of two things. The excellent view of the Alder patio and what was happening on it. Mrs. Alder and Doris Cole were having a discussion with Mrs. Alder doing all the talking. Even from this distance, I could see the anger on both their faces. Then, after a few minutes, both women went into the house. Five minutes later, I was still wishing I could have heard the words. Well, Miss Cole, won't you come in? Well, I uh, only stopped for a moment. Glad you did. I... uh... Just wanted to apologize for my behavior when we ran into each other on the stairs a little while ago. Oh, nonsense. It was my fault. No, no. I I meant, well, I was so brusque and... Well, I just don't know what I could have been thinking of. Oh, you were nothing of the kind. Don't worry about it. You're you're very nice about it. Very nice. Well, uh, excuse me now, won't you? Oh, sure thing, Miss Cole. Thanks for taking the trouble. Yes, 
I watched her as she hurried down the hall. An awkward woman who left you with one strong impression that she had little feel for the social graces. The impression was emphasized about two minutes later by a second visitor. One who knew all about the social graces. Constance Alder, all smiles and charm. I'll bet you thought we ran out of food, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> I was kind of wondering. Blame El Mantante. Does he eat everything in the house? Oh, no, not quite. He just refuses to allow dinner to be served. Insists that tonight he's the host, that it's his evening. Oh, what does that mean? Dinner in town, the high lie matches, and night clubbing afterward. He simply won't be refused. Insists that everyone in the house be his guest. Sound attractive? Well, it would be pretty hard to say no to an offer like that. Good. Don't be long. Everyone's dressing like mad. It should be quite an evening. <laughs> It was. Montante was acknowledged to be a great matador. He had just as much class outside the arena. He ordered a dinner, and it was gourmet time. He placed our bets at the Highland matches, nothing but winners. And at the nightclub, nothing but champagne. For a group of people living in a house loaded with tension, it was a ball. And a lot of it was because of the matador's quiet, easy manner. He was a man who knew how things should be done and did them. It was pretty tough not to like him. Constance Alder seemed to feel the same way, her eyes always on him. But the matador himself was never once out of line, never said or did anything that could possibly offend Billy Alder. And for a busy host, he was observant. I found that out while the others were dancing. Perhaps I can answer the question, Senor Dollar. I haven't asked one, Senor Montante. In words, no. But it's not difficult to interpret. You watch Mrs. Alder, then me. Then a question is in your eyes, no? You're a pretty sharp fellow, Senor Matador. And a uh, gentleman, Senor. I do not pursue other men's wives. The question is answered? Partly. What happens when you're the pursuit? I see. Senor Dollar, women with money but without great beauty, they try to compensate, each in her own way. Hers is not unusual. Acquisition. The company and attendance of a man who is presentable, admired. I am not unknown in the arena. So for the moment, it is my company. Tomorrow, a better known companion, if one should appear. As simple as that. It's sad, no, senor? And a little embarrassing. Thanks. And I'm the one who's embarrassed. I thought your eye was on the Alder fortune. <laughs> S Senor, you know what I receive for a Sunday afternoon in any Latin American country? Ten thousand dollars. Sometimes more. Your question is answered, Senor? Well, not quite. Why does a fella take bullfight lessons? Like I said, the evening was pleasant, but it was still a job. Watching Doris Cole now, awkwardly dancing with Billy Alder, I kept thinking of her argument with Mrs. Alder, her furtiveness. I felt sure she'd been the one who'd searched my room and there would never be a better chance to return the compliment. So I developed a sudden killing headache and over the protests of the others, said goodnight and grabbed a cab for the Alder house in Aguiara. In Miss Cole's room, I did a hurried but thorough search and came up with two things that proved real interesting. A passport with Doris Cole's picture but made out to one Dora Jansen. And an unsigned letter, postmarked New York. In a quick scrawl, it said simply that the Caribbean star would arrive in La Guerra on the 17th. I'm sorry about your headache, Mr. Dollar, but there is no aspirin in my room. Johnny Dollar. Uh, Dollar? There's Alder here. There must be something the matter with the house phone. I thought I rang a different room. Doris Cole's room, Mr. Alder? Well, yes. That's what you got. Now, uh, see here, Dollar, you're not questioning that woman. You're badgering her. We were simply discussing two headaches and the value of aspirin. Want to speak to her? I just wanted to be sure everything was all right. Both of you running out of the nightclub with headaches like that. Oh, everything's fine. I'd like to speak to you, though. Sorry, it's late. I have a long day tomorrow. I'm afraid it's important. Good night, Dollar. Are you thinking of arresting me, Mr. Dollar? I'm not a policeman, Miss Cole. You act like one. 
Answering my phone, sneaking into my room while I'm gone? That evens the score, then. You had a quick look through mine earlier in the day. Mr. Dollar. Just what were you looking for, Miss Cole? From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Caracas, Venezuela, to the Home Office Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Alder Matter. Expense account continued. Back in my own room after saying goodnight to a sullen Doris Cole, I didn't feel the slightest qualms about having invaded her room and lying about the reason for it. Why should I? The people in the Alder house didn't seem too concerned with the truth. In fact, the whole case seemed to be a question of lie or say nothing. Consider, Billy Alder had been shot at, indicating he had a good reason to change beneficiaries five times in a month. And still, he was the original say-nothing fella. Keep me alive was all I could get out of him. His wife had lied, his daughter had lied, and Doris Cole, an old friend of the family, had just proved to be a walking lie. The passport I'd found in her room had her photograph all right, but it said she was Dora Jansen. An unsigned letter in the same drawer had stated simply that the Caribbean star would dock tomorrow. I got into bed, and an odd thought hit me. If the Caribbean star didn't dock, would the steamship company have joined the Liars Club, too? Expense account item seven, ten cents, one newspaper bought on the La Guiara docks early next morning. My Spanish is pretty nothing, but I could read the important thing, that the Caribbean star was due at noon. With time to kill, I drove into Billy Alder's office in Caracas. He hit the ceiling when I told him about Doris Cole's passport. I was suddenly glad I'd mentioned nothing about the letter. Dollar, how dare you search the room of a guest in my house? How dare you? Just returning a courtesy. What? Mine was searched thoroughly. Well, that still isn't any reason for your behavior. Oh, one-way ethics, Mr. Alder? I've told you repeatedly, Dollar. There's only one reason I want you here. I know. Keep you alive. But how? With handcuffs on... Now, suppose I told you to find some oil, then refuse to let you dig any holes in the ground. You'd begin to smell a rat, wouldn't you? What are you talking about? Just about everything in this cell. Look, I have a very busy... Who is Dora Jansen, Mr. Alder? And why does she call herself Doris Cole? You're making too much of nothing, Dollar. It isn't a crime to use another name. That depends on the reason, doesn't it? Yeah, she's... An old friend. Oh, who isn't? Dollar, I... Aren't you tired of that tune? For a man who's afraid for his life, you've got more old friends than anyone I ever knew. Also, I haven't noticed anything particularly friendly between you. Yeah, she's, she's not a well woman, Dollar. I, I don't want you bothering You don't want me bothering anyone. Exactly. Not even the one who fired that shot at you. So I can't help getting an impression that you have a pretty good idea of who it might have been. I told you I was busy, Dollar. Yeah, but it's what you haven't told me I keep thinking about. Um, Dollar. What? Did, uh, did you find anything else in that room... Beside the passport? Why, Mr. Alder, what's happened to your sense of ethics? There was still plenty of time before the Caribbean Star would be docking, and Billy Alder's reaction had dictated my next move. The cable office in Aguiara suddenly seemed like a very important place to visit. There were too many silent mouths in Caracas, and I needed one that had something to say. Ah, okay, miss. You can take this now. See, si, senor. How you like this to go? Don't spare the horses. Okay. Uh, Cable, Rush. Ah, see. Si. Victor Kelly, World... Yeah, I know my lousy handwriting here. To Victor Kelly, Worldwide Mutual, Hartford, Connecticut, USA. See. Si. Want all possible information, Dora Jansen, a.k.a. Doris Cole, U.S. Passport, 19B67943-11, signed dollar. And your address for the answer? Uh, I'll pick it up here. As you wish. And lady, please... I know, senor. Don't spare the horses. It was still early when I reached the waterfront where the Caribbean Star would soon be docking. There wasn't much point in watching the incoming passengers. I didn't even know who I was looking for. So I found a spot at the pier entrance where I could concentrate on those meeting the passengers. Here I made a grudging concession to all movie detectives. Item seven, another ten cents, another newspaper. To hide behind. And you know something? It works fine. Doris Cole, or according to that passport, Dora Jansen, was nervous, excited. And it was no trouble to stay close behind her as she met a passenger. 
a short, nondescript man in his late 50s. When they jumped into a cab and hurried away from the pier, they were closely followed by a man clutching an unread newspaper, me. The trip was a short one, about six or seven blocks away. The cab in front pulled up at a cheap hotel on the waterfront. I circled the block once, got rid of my cab, and wandered into the dismal lobby. The fat, sleepy clerk made a concession. He opened one eye. See, you look for something. Yeah, that uh, gentleman who just came in, I, uh, I had an appointment with him. Oh, darn it, I, I must have left the slip of paper with his name on it in my hotel. I can't find it. Uh, it's too bad. You know, the gentleman who just went up to room, uh, room, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want me to say the number now, huh? <laughs> Don't you think I ever been to a movie? Oh, no, really, you can save me a lot of embarrassment. You've got it right there on the register. See? Mind if I have a look? I mind. Look, friend... When was the last time you got anything for free, friend? Oh, why didn't you say so? I was trying not to offend you. Here. Here, let me see. You play blackjack, senor, how you call it, uh, 21? Yeah, why? Like they say, hit me again. Oh, you're rubbing it in. See, you want to do business or no? Item nine, ten bucks, market schmear, schmooze, or just plain graft. He pointed an oversized forefinger at a name on the ledger, lost interest in me, went back to sleep. Arthur Singer, it said, room eight. I went up the stairway. A few seconds later, I moved as quietly as I could down the grimy second floor hallway, stopped at the door of number eight. At first, I heard nothing. Then after a long minute, the voices began, angrily, as though resuming an old argument. I don't know. Then let me handle it. No, no, what about him? Suppose he What does he does? You want it all to go for nothing? Now, you listen to me. I know what I'm doing. Five minutes later, I was back in the cable office getting a second message off to Vic Kelly in Hartford. It was a request for anything he could possibly dig up on Arthur Singer. I didn't hope for too much because it would probably turn out to be an uh, alias, but it was an angle I couldn't afford to overlook. You're not back for answers so soon, senor. Oh, no, I just want you to get this one off. Same fella. And same way, no spare the horses? That's it. And thanks. It's nada. Oh, senor, I want to ask you something. Shoot. Your business partner, did I do something to displease him? He seemed so angry. My who seemed so what? Well, he was so nice at first, but after he read the message... Wait a minute, hold everything. First of all, I have no business partner. Oh, then I make terrible mistakes. Oh, just tell me what happened. Well, this man, he come in less than a minute after you leave, was very nice. Yeah. Said he was your business partner, that he'd just leave you. You were worried because you forgot whether you say something in the message you just sent. Then you asked him to check it for you. Mm -hmm. He seemed to know what he was talking. So you showed it to him. Then? That is when he got so angry. He just put it down and leave. What did he look like? A little less tall than you, and he have gray hair. Eyeglasses? See, si, eyeglasses. Gray suit? See, si, senor. Gray suit. You know him? I'm beginning to wonder if anyone really does. I am so sorry for my mistake, senor. Oh, forget it. It wasn't your fault. Uh, just send that second message. Si, senor. About the answers. Send them to me at William Alder's house as soon as you get them. Maybe we'll read them together. Sure. Billy Alder was my new business partner. Alder, the original close-mouthed fellow. But it looked like there was nothing wrong with his brain or his eyesight. Then suddenly I didn't mind that he'd read my message to Vic Kelly... Because a frightened man usually reacts at the extreme ends of the scale. He'd been at the let's-do-nothing end. Maybe he'd now go the other way. There was one more step I could make on the waterfront, so I made it. My credentials presented at the steamship offices got me a look at the passenger list of the Caribbean Star. The name Arthur Singer wasn't on it. I started down the small waterfront street to where my car was parked. My mind was full of Billy Alder and the pieces of this crazy puzzle, tugging one way, pulling another. <laughs> Trying to make sense out of it somehow, I used some sort of slide rule where logic could be a solid base. And no matter how I twisted it, I knew one thing. It just wouldn't work. I didn't have enough yet to make it work. I was just reaching for the door handle when I saw his reflection in the car window. The man who'd sneaked up behind me, blackjack raised high in the air. The blackjack was just insurance. He was tough enough without it. I finally worked him to the side of the car, managed to half Nelson, and let the car door workers my blackjack... Five seconds later, an officer came rushing up, and five minutes later, I sat in the office of Jefe Velasquez, chief of police. You feeling all right now, amigo? Yeah, yeah, sure. 
What did you get out of that blackjack artist? Just what I expected. Still won't say who hired him, huh? You have to understand this kind of fellow, amigo. I do, huh? What I mean, he's a uh, 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 assassino pequeño, you, you know? She put uh, See, si, see. Si. For extra two Bolivar, maybe three, he would blackjack his mother. He claims he does not know who hired him, that he is to get his money in a letter. <laughs> that one I was spats. Okay. I say he's lying. Of course, but he will stick to the story because he knows he will get the same sentence whether he tells or he does not. A cheap hood won't usually cover for somebody else. This guy does, amigo. Otherwise, he would never be hired again. I'd, uh... I'd give a lot for a few minutes alone with him, Jefe. Sorry, Juanito, but I like my job. Yeah, just wishful thinking. <laughs> Not hard to understand. Well... You are leaving? Not getting anywhere sitting here. Are uh, you sure you haven't got business somewhere else? Uh, I got an awfully big yen to talk to that thug. You know, I got a hunch... Forget it, amigo. It's like I say. If you ask him on a Monday what is the day, he must tell you Tuesday. You could beat him to death, he will still say Tuesday. Is the way they think. A fair favor. If I can... Suppose I don't prefer charges. Would you put a tail on him when he leaves? Johnny. Look, look, I know it's a million to one against a hood doing a rough up without the money in hand, but if he hasn't collected you. Come, amigo, like you say, a million to one. I know, I'm grabbing at straws, but just in case, if hey, come on, huh? Okay. Good, thanks. Hey, where do you go? Back to the cable office. Oh? Yeah. And if a man in Hartford has nothing to say, I've got a permanent seat behind the eight ball. <laughs> Johnny Dollar. Good morning, Senor Dollar. Is La Guiara Cable Office calling? We have an answer to cables you sent to Hartford, Connecticut. Good. Would you like me to read the message, Senor? No, I'm on a telephone with extensions. Oh, I see. Perhaps you prefer I have it delivered then? No, no, I don't. Then you will come in for it yourself? Yeah, just as fast as I can get there. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Caracas, Venezuela, to the Home Office Worldwide Mutual Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the Alder Matter. Expense account continued. At the cable office, I ran into another dead end. Vic Kelly, back in Hartford, had come up with absolutely nothing on either Dora Jansen, who called herself Doris Cole, or Arthur Singer, the little man she'd hurried off an incoming liner yesterday. Complete strikeout. I headed outside, caught a glimpse of Mrs. Billy Alder watching me from across the street. Social life changing, Mrs. Alder? Does being my hostess include tailing me? Does being on Laguerre Street constitute tailing you? <laughs> Preserve me from amateur detectives. Good morning, Mr. Dollar. Now, oh, come on. You rushed out of the house so fast you couldn't possibly have eaten. I'll buy you breakfast. <laughs> I knew it was curiosity that made her take me up. She just couldn't resist the thought that maybe I'd give something away, let something slip. She ate warily, tentatively. We must have looked like two boxers in a close fight sitting on the edge of their stools, waiting for the last round, the one that would decide the winner. You're staring. Thinking. You love your husband, Mrs. Alder? It better be a reason for a question like that. Let's stop sparring, huh? You know why I'm down here. Do I? You told me you did the other day. So I did. Now, don't be aloof, lady. You're not that much in the clear. You've been the beneficiary several times and dropped. My daughter is the present one, I believe. And what exactly is your point? There's been no crime committed. No crime? Somebody's bullet misses your husband by inches and you call it no crime? Thank you for breakfast. Don't forget, I saw you out on the grounds of the house searching the place that shot came from. I told you before. You knew an automatic pistol was used, admitted looking for a shell. You talk too much, Mr. Dollar. And you talk too little. Look, why have you been tailing me? It's certainly not to see that I'm protecting your husband's life. So it's obviously to make sure that I don't find out something. Now, what is it, Mrs. Alder? And why is it so terribly important I don't find out about it? If you won't leave, Mr. Dollar, I will. There's this about getting someone angry enough, fearful enough. It makes them forget about caution. Mrs. Alder never once looked back, simply headed straight for the cheap little waterfront hotel where Arthur Singer was staying. 
She stayed for over half an hour, and when she left, she still looked frightened. Whatever the game was, it looked like everyone was a player but me. But Mrs. Alder's move helped, started an idea gnawing at me. So I headed for Caracas in the office of a smart cop, Jefe Velasquez. I needed someone to talk to, and the Jefe was a good listener. Come, amigo, sit down. Tell me where it feels wrong, huh? Billy Alder. He does all that changing in his policy, so I assume he's scared of being knocked off. Probably by one of the people who has been named a beneficiary of the policy. So? So now I'll take the other people concerned. Alder's wife is as much a clam as her husband is. Also, she knows what kind of a gun was used to take that shot at him. Dora Jansen, a woman who uses an alias and is obviously afraid of me. Arthur Singer, a little man Dora has hidden in a waterfront hotel. And now I find Alder's wife knows about the little man, too. Conclusion, amigo? That the three of them are in on something together. But not to kill Alder for that policy. His daughter gets it all. Yet Alder is afraid. And I think he's scared of something the others know. Now, suppose that shot wasn't meant to kill him, just frighten him, a sign that somebody meant business. That is a nice piece of logic. Yeah. Now all I got to do is make it work. Look, Hefe, whatever this deal is, nobody's going to make a move till I'm out of here. So? So, good, bad, or indifferent, I'm going to do a little acting. I stayed with Velasquez another half hour, setting things up as best I could. Then I drove to the airport and paid item 11, $309.80 for a plane ticket marked Hartford, Connecticut. Sure, it was an expensive prop, but this was one act I had to be convincing in. I drove back to Caracas, pasted a real angry look on my face, marched into Billy Alder's sumptuous office and threw the airline ticket on his desk. He studied it for a long minute. What does this mean, Dollar? That I've had all of you I can take, Alder. You and your keep me alive. You are going back to the States? You can read. The ticket says Hartford, Connecticut. It also says the six o'clock plane, because there's nothing earlier. But, but why? Why, Dollar? So I can get back and make my recommendations to the insurance company. You know what I'm going to recommend, Alder. Now, please, wait. That they cancel your policy because of your refusal to cooperate. Sorry, Alder. Now, Dollar, please. Now, don't do it. I beg There's you. There's a clause in that policy. I don't care about that policy. Now, don't you understand? I understand what? Listen to me. All that changing of beneficiaries... I only did that to make them send someone down here. I need protection. Against what? I... I'm in a jam. All I want is protection until... until it's peacefully settled. Do you understand? No, plainer. I know someone wants to kill me over a business deal. I'm asking you to see that I stay alive until I have time to... to reason with this man. Who is he? I, I can't tell you. Then let me tell you something. He's just arrived in town. How did you... Don't you see, Mr. Dollar? You must stay. Sorry. Goodbye, Mr. Alder. I went back to the Alder house, packed my bag, and said my goodbyes. Neither Mrs. Alder nor Dora Jansen wept. I drove to the airport, checked my luggage in. Then I slipped away, drove back to Caracas the long way. A half hour later, I checked into a little side street hotel where Jefe Velasquez had reserved a room for me. Then came the hardest part, the waiting. That six o'clock plane must have been way out over the Caribbean when the call finally came. Uh, yeah? Velasquez here. You tired of waiting? Oh, brother, you know it. Look, Jefe, your men check in. Maybe I should have taken part of the work. Be patient, amigo. Your whole idea depends on the thinking you took that plane. You must stay right where you are. But uh, what about your men? Have I they... I get a call every couple minutes, amigo. Alder, his wife, the Dora Johnson, uh, Arthur Singer. I can tell you every move they make in the last three hours. But they haven't made the one I'm waiting for, huh? You will know it three minutes after they make it. If they make it. Thanks, F.A. Five minutes later, Velasquez called again. He took only enough time to tell me he was on his way and to be down on the street in two minutes. I was. I only beat him by seconds. Come on, amigo. Well, it looked like your plan worked, Juanito, this uh, Dora Johnson. Yeah. As soon as she learned your plane left, the one you did not take, she rushed to the waterfront hotel, pick up the Arthur Singer. Then the two of them rushed to the Alder house. And? Alder must have seen him coming because he jumped in his car and raced out in the direction of his oil village, Caranero. 
They see him and follow him. That's where we headed for. Then we better get things going, get there before Singer kills Alder. I don't know whether or not he deserves killing, but I know one thing. It'll cost my company a quarter of a million bucks. Velasquez's men were plenty good. Halfway to Carnero, one of them flagged us down, told us both cars had definitely passed his way. And when we reached the oil field, another one waited at the gate. He told us Billy Alder, Dora Jansen, and Arthur Singer were in a little work shack across the field. We left the car and moved as quietly as we could toward the shack. There was a weird feeling. In every direction, you could see the great oil rigs working, pumping, ignoring us. We reached the shack, peered cautiously through the window. An even weirder scene was taking place. An almost hysterical Dora Jansen pointed a luger at a sweating Billy Alder. A terrified Arthur Singer pleaded with her. Their words pushed easily through the thin wooden slab. Dora, don't, please don't do it. You'll only make things worse. Your brother's right, Dora. Dora, listen to me. Like he listened to you four years ago. What did it get him, Mr. Fancy Promoter? Tell me that. I'll make it right with him. A quiet gentleman. A bookkeeper who never did anything wrong in his life until you sold him a bill of goods. Now listen to me, both of you. So he rigged your books for you. Made false entries. Made it look like he was responsible for the bankruptcy. And he did the three years in prison that you should have done. For a hundred thousand dollars... That was the deal. And believe me, I'm not trying to cheat him. The money is tied up in my business. I need time, but I'll pay him. Pay him? It's been a year since he came out of jail. You'll never pay. You'll try to cheat him out of the money one way or another. I swear to you, Dora. It's a lot easier to kill him than pay him, isn't it? Oh, you're crazy. Is that why you kept the Luger in the house? Were you worried when he disappeared? When I shot at you to let you know I meant business? That's what you're doing. Dollar knows all about this. Oh, 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 yes. Your bodyguard must have gotten frightened after I had him beat up the other day. He's on his way to the States in a plane. Dora! No! I'm going to kill you. No! Come on. <laughs> Put it down, Dora. You pull that trigger and he'll still come out the winner. No! Senorita, do not make me fire, please. I don't care. As long as he gets what he deserves. Stand back! Senorita! For a split second, she wavered. Then the hate took over. <laughs> All this sank to the floor, disbelief on his face. Panic, she raced out into the night, and I went after her. Dara! No! Dara, hold it! No! There's no place to go! Dara! Hey, I'm gonna hear you here! Don't go in there! Ah! What happened to her, Josh? She panicked, turned to scream at me, and ran right into one of the protection fences around the derrick. She just passed out. She'll come around. How's all there? Conscious, but I do not know. We better get him to the hospital. Yeah, come on. She didn't mean to shoot him, mister. My sister wouldn't hurt anyone. Sure, sure. Go take care of her. She was only doing it for me. For me, mister. Only? I... I would have paid. I wasn't going to cheat him. Oh, Dollar, you know? Yeah, we heard it all. I'm glad it's over. Worrying. Want to tell me one thing, Alder? Your wife, where does she fit? She had nothing to do with it. Just knew about it. I wasn't too nice to her for a long time. Other women, her running around, just a way of punishing me, paying me back. She knew I couldn't afford to complain. Yeah, wish you'd have told me a long time ago, Alder. I couldn't. The case could always be reopened. Uh, uh, I couldn't face that. Would have hurt too much. Oh, yeah. But it wouldn't have hurt as much as that bullet. Expense account total, $833.14. Details. Billy Alder was rushed to the Caracas Hospital, underwent some excellent surgery, and uh, relaxed claims department. He's going to make it. As for his shady business tactics, well, that's out of my bailiwick. That's for the law boys. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a quiet cabin by a quiet lake, a place ideal for romance and ideal for murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Tony Barrett. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Gil Stratton, Harry Bartell, Barbara Fuller, John Dater, Virginia Gregg, Don Diamond, Vivi Janice, and Tony Barrett. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. 
Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Another solid serial written by Tony Barrett, who also acts in this one. Uh, in this one, we're also treated to an exotic locale, which I always felt Johnny Dollar should have done more of. We also get a really solid cast of characters and a nice mix of clues and red herrings on this case. Now, of course, there's a big problem with the logic of Billy Alder's actions. His method of seeking help was very roundabout. As the beating of Johnny Dollar illustrated, there are plenty of toughs around Karak who would have guarded him without asking any questions, or if they did ask any questions, they wouldn't have exposed him to some sort of legal liability. However, while Alder's logic is in decoying for an insurance man was flawed, the story and its logic aren't flawed. The problem with guys like Billy Alder, who managed to succeed with either morally gray or illegal actions, is that they often get what they want by pulling a fast one, and they get away with it, and that's addictive. If you've ever encountered a Billy Alder type in real life, you know what I mean. A normal person trying to imagine what they would do if they had no ethics would imagine simpler solutions to problems. But the Billy Alder types come up with some plan where they put something over on someone, and when they get caught, you wonder, why the heck did you make it that complicated? Why did you go for something petty like getting an insurance company to foot the bill for your protection when your life is in danger. But left to their own devices, they can't help themselves, so I found this realistic. My one complaint is the bit with Dora running to, into the wall. It feels like there should have been an effect for that, uh, rather than us having to find out solely through narration. Her crashing into the wall should have made a noise, or at least it should for the purpose of audio dramatization. Other than that, I, again, another really solid serial written by Mr. Barrett. Uh, well, now we go to listener comments and feedback, and uh, we have a couple of comments from Spotify. Uh, James wrote regarding the Sea Legs matter, great episode. Another listener emailed in to say, oh yes, Pagon used a different name, but he couldn't fool us listeners. And then there was a comment regarding the Tears of Night matter, uh, which I guess was a while back at this point, but the commenter said on Spotify, I like this episode, Johnny doesn't fall for many women. Well, Terry, I guess that depends on how you would define many, but thank you so much for the comment, really appreciate it. And finally, from the listener survey, we have a comment from Emmett, who writes, hearing Adam's cheery voice before and after each episode is what makes this podcast stand out from all the other old-time radio podcasts. Even if the content were available elsewhere, I'd keep listening to the great detectives. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate the comment, Emmett. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. And being the first Friday in January, we're thanking the Patreon supporter who has been supporting the program for five years today. And I want to go ahead and thank David. David's been one of our Patreon supporters, again, since January 2019, currently supporting the podcast at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more. Thank you so much for your support, David. 
And that will do it for today. If you're enjoying the podcast, please follow us using your favorite podcast software. And be sure to rate and review the podcast wherever you download it from. We'll be back on Tuesday with another Yours Truly Johnny Dollar serial. But join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet, where... Hi. Morning, Kevin. Hi. Got a minute? Yeah. Cutter Printing Company was robbed last night. How much? There's the crime report. 14,500. Yeah, it's a big haul. You're yeah, most familiar. Climbed a drain pipe to the roof, kicked in a skylight. Yeah. Conrad Buckley's back in town. I think it might add up. Could be. Sounds like it. There's one sure way to make him. Put him in small words and big type. I don't know how to make it any more positive than the last time. I don't know if that creek with a lamp ever found an honest man, but get the guy. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.